Good evening all. Quick update. I have arrived back safely and successfully from France and all recording quality should be back to more or less normal as I get my new computer set up. Anyway, here's Vandervelle. The most recent of the hypercar debutantes, the Van Wall Vandervelle 680, comes to us from the Austro-German I almost said Austro-Hungarian, by Collis Van Wall Racing Team, helmed by Colin Collis. Although by Collis got their start in Formula 3 before moving into the DTM world, they also campaigned one of the few privateer Audi diesel prototypes to ever make an appearance, an R10 TDI in 2009, before switching to Lotus chassis prototypes in LMP2 and non-hybrid LMP1 throughout the 2010s, although they have failed to complete in 24 hours of Le Mans race since 2009 with each subsequent result either a DNF or a DQ. The team's appropriation of the Van Wall name is rather a curious one. The original Van Wall team was a British-based constructor in Formula One in the 1950s. Founded by Tony Vandervelle, a bearing manufacturer, they started out racing modified Ferraris before graduating to in-house built vehicles. Sound familiar, Glickenhaus? In 1956, after enlisting a young Colin Chapman, later founder of Lotus, to improve their vehicles. 1957 saw Sterling Moss join the team as their lead driver alongside Harry Shell and Maurice Trintignant, and 1958 brought the team victory in the first Formula One Manufacturers Championship, with six outright wins in 11 races, and Sterling Moss finishing second in the Drivers' Championship, trailing Ferrari's Mike Hawthorne by a single point. However, Vandervelle's health was poor, and without his direct involvement, the team's activity waned until it folded in 1961. The mark then lay dormant until 2003, when a chap named Arthur Wolstenholme undertook to produce a road-legal replica of the Grand Prix racer, named the Van Wall GPR V12. Despite a brief but glowing review on Top Gear, Series 7, Episode 2 for those interested, it never really made a much splash in the automotive world, and the trademark changed hands a few times throughout the 2010s until the Baikalis team announced their rebranding in 2022. So what, you may ask, does the new Baikalis Van Wall team have to do with the Formula One manufacturer of the 1950s? Excellent question. Realistically, it's, well, it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely nothing. Apart from a, a six degrees of separation style web that one could attempt to draw through their previous association with Lotus, uh, there's not much that I can find to establish a lineage. Heck, they, they don't even have a British driver on their roster, nor even a citizen of a Commonwealth nation after they cut Jacques Villeneuve out of a drift. The decision, then, to co-opt the Van Wall name seems to have been taken primarily to satisfy the hypercar rule specifying cars must be associated with a road car manufacturer. Although this also fails on further inspection, since the Van Wall team originally never made road cars, and the only road cars made by later organizations with the same name were low-production throwback machines. But, to satisfy that end, the current team has announced their intent to sell a road car offering based on their LMH. Of course, whether anyone actually purchases one remains another matter, and this season's performance so far does not bode particularly well for future sales. Anyway, whatever name the team has printed on their shirts and vehicle badges, back in 2018, Baikalis embarked on this project to build a new hypercar leveraging their previous experience in LMP1 and LMP2 while continuing their partnership with engine supplier Gibson, whose naturally aspirated GL458 4.5 liter V8 powers the 680. Everyone can probably recite from memory the part that comes next. The engine is a fully stressed component of the chassis, making the class required 500 kilowatts or 671 horsepower. Power goes to the rear wheels through an extract sequential box, this time a six-speed unit. Brakes are carbon-based rotors the size of dinner platters from AP Racing, with six-pot AP calipers, and the BBS wheels are shod with Michelin rubber. All about as one would expect. The engine's torque figure does seem low, at only 410 pound-feet of torque, but with a naturally aspirated engine and no hybrid system, it is eh, perhaps not unexpected. Originally planned to debut in the 2020 season alongside Toyota and Glickenhaus, 
the regulatory dithering in the early hypercar rule set added to redesign delays that pushed the readiness date into 2022, at which point homologation issues and legal disputes around ownership and use of the Van Wall name and trademark resulted in a rejected application to compete in the 22 season, and it was only several weeks before the opening of the 23 season at Sebring that they received permission to compete in this year's World Endurance Championship. In the interim between the two seasons, some testing was conducted at Zweibrücken Airfield and at the Lausitzring, but distances covered seemed to have ranged in the hundreds or low thousands of kilometers, rather than the 10,000 plus kilometer test campaigns undertaken by their factory rivals. Consequently, the 2023 season has not been kind to the 680. While they managed a surprising 7th in class at the Sebring 1000 mile race, 30th overall, outlasting the Sol Glickenhaus, a Peugeot or Peugeot, and a Ferrari, the Portimao race saw an explosive brake failure that led to retirement, and a contretemps with a Ferrari GT car at Spa saw a similar retirement. Both incidents, as well as another coming together with a Ferrari GT during the Sebring prologue, all occurred while driver Jacques Villeneuve was at the wheel which led to an unexpected, arguably, last-minute team announcement that he was to be replaced with Tristan Vautier, late of the Mustang sampling Cadillac DPI team, for the 24 hours of Le Mans. In what can only be considered an ironic twist of fate, the Van Wall team's Le Mans outing was equally disappointing, with a retirement coming in the 16th hour due to a suspected engine failure, while being driven by none other than Tristan Vautier, its fourth consecutive retirement of the season. With Monza coming up this weekend, the Vandervelle 680 has another chance to seek redemption, or at least a finish, but barring a perfect storm of circumstances, it remains unlikely that they will find themselves atop the podium in Italy. That brings us to the end of another video, and until we see the Isota Frescini make its debut, the end of the hypercar guides. Let us know what you would like to see next. I'm currently sifting through about 20,000 photos from Le Mans and Le Mans Classic, so peruse those entry lists and see if there's anything that catches your eye. For this week's call to action not featuring the three sacred words of YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, why not take some time this weekend to clean out the kitchen junk drawer? You know the one I'm talking about, with a, a phone charger from three hardware standards ago, a lidless Tupperware with a bunch of rubber bands and paper clips tangled together, some outdated takeout menus. For bonus points, compare those restaurants' current prices to those on the oldest menu you can find. Receipts from three years ago of a few broken pencils and dried up pens. Uh, maybe some little plastic figurines from a decade ago. You know what I mean. There's all sorts of weird things in the back of those if you really dig. Anyway, have a good evening, everyone.